shouldn't be standing here today. How, how's the mic? Was I too? Is this too close? Is this better? What's better? This is good. Okay. So look, bottom line is I should be dead. That's the truth of the matter. Because of the way I drank, I shouldn't be here. As was said earlier today. I am glad to be looking down at the grass and not up at the grass because I'm six feet under. I'm alive today because I made the life-saving decision to give up alcohol five and a half years ago. And I'm really, really proud to be a woman in long-term recovery. Now, five and a half years is still pretty early when you're talking about Recovery, I mean, I don't have 30 years like John Schinholzer, but I'm getting there, and I'm getting there one day at a time, and that's how it is. That's it, it's one day at a time, no more, no more than that. How many of you sitting here are in recovery? Put your hands up. Very recovery friendly audience, that's great. I love it, give yourselves a hand. September is recovery month. I hope everybody knows that, right? Now, October, as we all know, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and, and that's great, and we certainly support that, but a lot of people don't know that this is the month that we celebrate recovery. So that's one of the reasons why we're all here today is, well, here's what it says from the SAMHSA website. Recovery Month spreads the positive message that behavioral health is essential to overall health, prevention works, treatment is effective, and that people can and do recover. Like me, like you. We can recover, we do recover. If you had told me six years ago that I would be speaking at a rally where I was talking about being sober, I would have laughed. And that's because six years ago, I was living a very sad, I'll tell you what, this mic didn't work the way I'm doing it. I'm just gonna stand here, I think this will be better. Six years ago, I was living a very sad and very small life. If I wasn't drinking, I was thinking about a drink, or I was recovering from a drink or 20 drinks in one night. Maybe that's familiar to some of you. I had turned my will and my life over to the substance of alcohol. Alcohol was everything to me. Really nothing else mattered. And what's amazing is that, is that now I've turned my will and my life over to a higher power that keeps me sober each and every day. And I can't do it without my higher power, which happens to be God. So, Maybe some of you know that I used to be, this is the line from the movie Anchorman, I used to be kind of a big deal, okay? <laughs> now I like to go around telling people, don't you know who I was? <laughs> For many, many years I was an anchor on, I have the distinction of being the only anchor who was in all three cable networks, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News Channel, and I've had a 21 year career, and it's been great. I can tell you that this, is a whole lot more rewarding than any broadcast that I ever anchored in my life. Being here, talking about, not the disease, but talking about how we can live happy and productive lives because we're sober. What I'm doing now is what I believe I was put on earth to do, which is to spread the word of help and hope. Help is out there, hope is out there. You can go on to live a happy life if you choose to live intoxicant free like 23 million of us in this country have. So, from the outside, this may sound familiar, from the outside, I look like somebody who had a lot of stuff. Had my own show on a national cable network. Attractive, always looked nice, had a beautiful apartment on Central Park. Closet full of clothes, a lot of friends, a lot of money, a lot of this, a lot of that, you know. But I was dead. I wasn't really living, I was just existing, and there was certainly no way to go through life. In fact, it was, it was pretty lonely, it was pretty small, and it was pretty sad. 
So on March 14, 2007, I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of this stuff because it was just bad. I don't know how else to say it. It was bad. I'll give, all right, I'll give you a couple of examples of just how unmanageable it was. I woke up in the emergency room of a New York City hospital one morning and I did not know how the heck I'd gotten there. I had been discovered face down on the floor of my kitchen and was rushed to the emergency room in an ambulance after a night that started out like any other night. Started out with me going to dinner at 7.30. It ended up at 7.30 the next morning with me coming to in an emergency room. But do you think I got sober then? Nope. Because I have a disease that tells me I don't have a disease. I have a disease that tells me that it's okay to keep drinking because that's just the way I'm wired. It took me two and a half years to get into recovery after I woke up in the ER. That's probably the biggest example of how incredibly unmanageable and dismal and dreadful my life had become. So, after years of knowing that I had what I called a little drinking problem, as I euphemistically referred to it, it occurred to me that I was a functioning alcoholic. In fact, I used to brag about the fact that I was a functioning alcoholic because I got up and went to work every day, had a big fancy TV job, managed to get to the studio, had my hair and makeup team, thank goodness, who put my face together again after a bad night out, and I would go on and deliver the news. I took pride in the fact that I could have this big fancy high paying job and drink with impunity and drink however I wanted to. Uh, wasn't very glamorous. You know, I can tell you that sleeping on the floor of my office at Fox News Channel 30 minutes before going on TV, because I literally could not sit up, I was that hungover, that's not glamorous. It's not particularly fun either. So, you know, a lot of people say, what was your bottom, Lori? I didn't have a particular bottom. I was lucky I never got a DUI. I never killed someone never got in a fist fight, ended up in jail. You know, nothing like that ever happened. And I never lost a job in all those years of heavy, heavy drinking. But my bottom was a series of little things that happened to me. Like the fact that I could never remember what I'd done the night before. Or never remember the phone calls that I made the night before. And having to make apologies over and over again. You know, for whatever I said last night, I'm sorry the preemptive apologies that I made to people, because I never knew what was gonna come out of my mouth. So, another thing that led me to getting sober was the fact that my, my sister was pregnant. I don't have any kids of my own, but now I'm a very proud aunt of two little boys, but five and a half years ago, my sister was pregnant, and I knew that I never wanted this unborn baby to see his or her aunt drunk. And I wanted to be the aunt that showed up for things, the aunt who showed up for the christening because she made her flight rather than missed her flight because she'd been really drunk the night before and just couldn't manage to drag herself to the airport. So I think my sister's pregnancy was the thing that got me sober. And it's the thing that keeps me sober. I stay sober for myself, but I really stay sober for those two little boys. Robert and Thomas, who are the love of my life. And if I can help it, and I can, those boys are never gonna see me drunk again. And that's the truth of the matter. So I have a few other things I, I wanna talk about today. And that is the solution. I went from someone who literally couldn't go two or three days without having a drink because I would start going through withdrawal to someone who can't imagine having a drink now. That's a miracle. Those of you who are in a 12-step program know what I'm talking about. It's the miracle of having the desire to drink lifted. I don't want to drink anymore, and that is a freaking miracle. 
It really is. So, my recovery is one day at a time. I don't worry about the fact that I can't drink today. I don't worry about the fact that, oh, you know, I'm never gonna be able to have a glass of buttery Chardonnay ever again, really. I don't worry about that stuff. I stay sober for today. So I've racked up a few 24 hours, but I know that one drink is going to lead me to a very bad path that eventually could lead to me dying. And I don't wanna die, I've got too much to live for. I'm worth it. And so is everybody in here. We're all worth it. You know, there's a, there's a sign in one of the rooms in the AA community, one of the uh, meetings I attend in New York City. And it says, what I let anybody do to me, what I've done to myself? And the answer is no. I would never have let anybody treat me the way I treated myself. But now, I treat myself with love and respect and kindness the way I treat others now. There's a, there's a lot, I, lot I could say. Um, I think there's some things that are absolutely key to being sober and staying sober. And that's honesty, openness, and willingness. I'm honest about my recovery. I'm honestly trying to put forth a message of help and hope and showing people that this is a disease that is not curable, but it is treatable. I am open. I went public 18 months ago because I thought it was the right thing to do. I thought it was the responsible thing to do. And I thought I can help more people by talking out than by staying silent because I believe that there's a lot of confusion between anonymity and secrecy. And there's a lot of stigma attached to this disease. And I wanna to try to fight that stigma. I wanna put a face on this disease like so, like everybody here today, we're putting a face on the disease that kills twice as many people as breast cancer does every year, by the way, did you know that? Alcoholism alone kills twice as many people as breast cancer does. So it's important that we try to chip away at the stigma that exists little by little every single day. Because I'd love to get to the point with addiction as we are with, with the HIV virus and breast cancer and some of these other diseases that get a lot of funding and a lot of attention. I wanna get there someday. We're gonna get there, but we gotta do it together. Because every 14 minutes in this country, somebody dies of addiction. Every 14 minutes. This disease costs us half a trillion dollars a year in lost wages, lost productivity, incarceration, institutionalization, hospitalization, cancer, and heart disease, and wet brain. And those are numbers that scare me. I don't like those numbers at all. So we got to get out there and we have to talk about it. Um, look, I think that One of the other messages that, that I think is very important is that there is no shame in being an addict. There's no shame in being an alcoholic. I was born this way. It runs in my family. I get addiction from both sides of my family. Unfortunately, I'm the only one in my family who has sought treatment, which makes me very sad. But it's the way it is, and I've let it go. Because I, there are a few people in my family I love who really need to get sober. They haven't, and I've got to be okay with it, and I am now, but we know it's a family disease. We know it affects every single American family. We also know that we can do something about it, and it's a disease that needs to be treated as a disease, not criminalized, not marginalized, and not ignored. Because look at how far we've come with other diseases. We gotta do the same for addiction and recovery. Recovery is a great thing. There are a lot of people living healthy, happy, productive lives. We are everywhere. We are presidents of the United States. Whether you like George W. Bush or not, he's been in active recovery for a long time as far as I know. 
We are priests and rabbis and pizza delivery guys and dentists and doctors and janitors. And we are everywhere. And we are all the same. We all have a disease that doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care who you are or where you're from. It is cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. It will wait for you. It will circle you like a buzzard and swoop in, which is why we've all got to stay sober for ourselves, for our families, for our communities at large. Because we can do a whole lot more alive than we can dead. And we can do together what we cannot do apart. There's a lot more. I had a whole speech written. I didn't say any of it. Because I just wanted to speak from the heart. And I thought, I was looking down at this, and I thought, okay, yeah, 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 all right, all right. I just threw it all out. Because, look, I think you all get this or you wouldn't be here today. You give a darn about this disease, and you care about recovery and people in recovery. And if you're not in recovery, you know someone who is. You have a lot, I guarantee you, everybody walking around here, even the people who say, well, I'm not in recovery and I don't know anybody. Yes, they do. We all know someone who's addicted to something. And we know a lot of people who are in recovery. We're making this choice one day at a time. And I can tell you that being here, I, I would, there's no other place I'd rather be than here today with you. Because I'm getting to do what I personally love, and that is to share the message of hope and help. That there's no shame in this. It takes courage to decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I mean, obviously, not every day is perfect. My, my life is not rainbows and unicorns every day. I mean, look, I've lost two jobs in sobriety. I've collected unemployment twice in recovery. Sometimes I don't know how I'm gonna pay the rent, but I can tell you I'm a lot happier now than when I had that big fancy TV job. It didn't mean anything to me, and this means something to me. And it means something to you or you wouldn't be here today. So thank you for your time and attention. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much.